Okay. Dr. Harris, I wonder if it would be fair to ask you to comment on the changing, uh, the significance of the uh, sexual revolution, if you will, as it relates to the student and his involvement with his community, with his parents, with the faculty members, and I'll let you narrow that question any way you want to. <laughs> well, it's a big question. <laughs> Trying to put it into a nutshell, I think perhaps one could say that the, the major change between uh, the present decade and pr probably all previous decades is that in the past young people have rebelled against their parents and against their elders. This is something that's always happened. But in the past they have, I think, more easily and more quickly gone back to the, the standards, the traditional patterns of their parents and that of the past. At the present time, these, these old authoritarian value systems are, are weakening. I think there's less tendency for them to go back to an old system. I think there's a greater necessity for them to work out a system for themselves, a new value system which they can live by. Do you think that this is, do you view this as an opportunity uh, that bodes well for mankind, at least as we find him here, or do you feel that it is terribly fraught with dangers? Well, I'm an incorrigible optimist. I, I, think, uh, I think it is a good opportunity. I think it will have to be uh, taken and, and used as an opportunity. But it seems to me that it's always a good thing when an occasion arises and we have to think and we have to uh, reevaluate the patterns that have come down from the past. Uh, we don't have a, an ideal civilization. There are many dangers for our civilization. I think it's a, it's a tragic kind of thing that people spend so much time thinking about sexual morality and not very much time thinking about what's happening in Vietnam, you see. And if, 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 our, if our young people are questioning these old values, let's use every resource that we have at our disposal, science, history, anthropology, which is my field, which of course I'm interested in getting in, and religion, as long as it's not the dogmatic authoritarian religion, which uh, really is being turned off, as they say, these days. But if it's a religion which brings in the, the best, the greatest inspiration man has had at his highest moments, the visions he's had, if we can combine this with science, if the knowledge we now have about human nature, about the way in which personality develops, all of these things, I think we can work on a new value system, which will be a good one. I think it will challenge our young people and our old people, I think we can rise to the challenge. I quite agree with the uh, old lady that I know who insists on, you know, when a friend of hers says, well, in my day they didn't do that, and, and the woman turns to her and says, this is my day. What would anthropology have to offer as far as making a beneficial use of this time of change? There's a, uh, no, I won't. <laughs> There's a cuneiform tablet which uh, was dug up uh, somewhere in the ruins of, I think it was Assyria or Babylonia, which talks about uh, young people going to the dogs, they don't obey their elders, they don't obey the laws, uh, everything's going into decline. Of course, the fact is that that culture did go into decline. People have been saying that for at least 3,000 years and probably for 10,000 or more, who knows. Young people have always done things differently than their parents have. It, it seems to me, however, from an anthropological point of view, that we really have a great deal of knowledge now about the way uh, value systems fit together. We know that morality is something which belongs to a value system. We also know that, that cultures come out with different kinds of people. And we can't make objective judgments uh, scientifically. Uh, we have to simply compare scientifically. But as people, we do have to make judgments. But the information which comes out of these cultural comparisons makes it possible for us to implement the, the highest vision we have of human personality, you see, and the highest knowledge we have about what human uh, personality, what human character, what the human being is actually capable of becoming. And if we put all these things together, it's a tremendous opportunity, as I see it. I would think that one of the things that unnerves um, those of us who are on the other side of the generation gap is that during the time that a student is in college, he is learning and he's challenging and he's questioning. And if he is uh, practicing free love or any other kind, this is fine, this is now. And whether you go in for uh, the Playboy philosophy or Dr. Ellis or anyone else along the line, that's one thing as it's viewed in this one group. What about the dispersing of these attitudes into society and into the community in general? 
I suppose one of the things we have to recognize is that many of the things which we think are absolutely uh, uh, tragic or completely destructive may actually not be. Perhaps we shouldn't be quite so much afraid of what's happening. Uh, these kinds of things have always happened. I know a college president who was fired because he, uh, this happened some years ago, uh, because he allowed too much necking in the women's dorm. <laughs> And his, I know one who was fired because he didn't go to the football games. <laughs> well, this particular man defended himself by saying that during the years in which he'd been president, there hadn't been but, I think, three pregnancies among the unmarried college girls, whereas in the previous equal period of years, there'd been 13. Now, this kind of thing's always happened, you see. And we ought to look at this a little bit more uh, uh, openly, a little bit more acceptingly. I'm not saying we ought to buy all these new ideas. I'm suggesting we simply ought to evaluate them intelligently. In evaluating them, would you uh, agree with those who say that the university or college student of today is more moral rather than less moral than his parents may have been? I don't know that I'd say he's more moral. I think he's a great deal more honest. I think he's, uh, I think he's seeking perhaps uh, more than his parents did. I think his parents were much more ready to accept the the traditional pattern, one that was handed down. One, one which, by the way, I think was not, not so very good in the long run. The, uh, the marriages I've seen among my own generation have not all been perfect marriages. Now, they may be very uh, moral in the sense of everything being legal, but there's been an awful lot of unhappiness among a lot of them. And I think perhaps a more honest generation that looks at sex more openly, that isn't afraid of sex, that isn't afraid of nudity, perhaps, that sees the human body as something which is basically a good thing rather than a bad thing. I think all of this will make them capable of, of looking at sex in a way which will perhaps create a, a greater degree of happiness in families in the future. I wonder if there, it will not be increasingly different, difficult for the student who rebels against his parents and the hypocrisy of their generation and the, the um, evaluating of morality in terms of, of income tax forms and stopping at stop signs. It would seem that uh, the insecurity that may come just from this ruptured relationship might have rather violent uh, implications for him. Yes, I think this is all part of what's causing the so-called sexual revolution. I think it's part of the rebellion against authority. I think, I think young people, a lot of people are recognizing, hippies for example, recognize that the, the morality of their parents' generation is, is not a real morality. It, it's, to a large extent, a false morality. It's a facade, and they've broken the facade. I don't think they always have anything to put in place of it. And I think much of their talk about love, which I think is a good thing, you see, I think much of their talk about love is a, a kind of neurotic seeking of that which they're not really capable of giving. But for the same, for the same reason, you see, if we can really understand what love means and what deep personal, interpersonal relationship means, then perhaps we can put sex into this context and we can build a value system in which sex will have a genuine place, in which enjoyment can really happen. And I'm not saying now whether or not it's going to follow the same patterns or not. I don't really know what patterns it's going to follow. All I can suggest is that we have the responsibility of working out this value system which will make it a good thing rather than something which is which is thought to be a pleasurable thing, but which is what we're afraid of, you see. It's rather difficult to quarrel with the placards and the demonstrators who carry signs saying, love. Right, it is. Thank you very much for talking with us. <laughs> Thank you. The end of the beginning of the okay. Okay, with the books. The, uh, the information I have from students that I've talked to who have grown up in the Israeli kibbutz is very interesting and related to sex. Uh, they don't uh, have these uh, strong taboos against premarital sex, for example, that we have in, in this country. They don't think too much about it, and yet there's really very little of it. And I think this is tremendously significant. I think perhaps one of the things which is back of this almost neurotic seeking after sex which you find in our culture, sale of, sale of Playboy magazines and and all of this sort of thing. The commercialization of sex that you find on the radio and TV and movies and every billboard and pornography, all of this sort of thing. I think perhaps this is because none of us had enough love when we were children. We weren't nursed long enough. We didn't have this close skin contact. We didn't have the kind of support which treats us as people rather than as, as things. We tend to treat children as things in our culture. And all of us grew up with a kind of, of longing, we, a seeking after love. 
and we get to be mature and we equate love with sex. And then we go chasing after sex, when sex really isn't, that is the perspective sex plays in life, is in, in the normal situation. And perhaps the kibbutzim have, have managed to create a greater degree of normality in their culture than we have. Would this be because they were always surrounded by loving approval of a sort, or? I think so, yes. I, I think they, they've always been surrounded by people who loved them, who supported them, who forgave them when they did wrong, who, uh, if someone uh, scolded them, somebody else they could go to and get comfort for it, you see. This child has to have this, otherwise he grows up with a, a hollow inside. He has to have this for self-respect. This has also provided some reinforcement for the working mother. Yes, I think perhaps it does. It also explains why perhaps the Haganah can have men and women both as soldiers. Right, right. <laughs>